Trinidad BWI, British West Indies. And the family followed him there later on. We, it was about August of 41. England was at war with Germany. So traveling from New York to Trinidad on a non-US flag carrier, we had to travel in blackout conditions at night. So that was my first time being one on a ship, two, in blackout conditions, and three, very seasick. <laughs> in 1942, we returned from uh, Trinidad. And the rest of the time, I spent New Jersey. And then I spent a few years in the Air Force. And after 31 years, uh, my lovely wife said, why don't you grow up and do something? So I got out and went to work in industry for a while. And when she retired in 2001, I came here. <coughs> Uh, yes, I am interested in history. So, let's see if that is. This is just a summary of what happened in uh, 1941, just to sort of bring you up to speed. Uh, those of you who, who are historians probably know a lot more than this. 
The one interesting thing that I find on this slide, and a lot of people don't remember it is, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. If they had not declared war on the United States, we would never have gone to war in Europe. We declared war on Japan after they attacked Pearl Harbor. So that was what's happening. You'll get a lot of information. Some of you may have been engaged in this. But what about at home? One of your own people from here was a political cartoonist. And in the 30s, late 30s, and into the early 40s, he produced uh, political cartoons for the newspaper. There is a book out. Um, it's a very interesting book. It's got some uh, interesting uh, uh, political cartoons about elections and stuff in it. Get a chance, check the library, check around here. I'm sure you can find it. But what were people doing here? What were you doing here during this time? They declared war. And just before war, there were a lot of people that says, we don't want this. America first. Charles Lindbergh was one of those in America first. But we finally went to war. I'm not very technical, so. <laughs> rationing. There's a display in the back here about ration coupons and everything else. If you remember, those are the things that were rationed. You had ration books. The little blue and uh, red circles were also OPA stickers that you could use for, for milk and bread. So while you were buying things here, you were very lucky being here in La Jolla and in San Diego. Things were rationed in the United States. They weren't rationed in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> There are a few people that used to go across there, and I have had individuals that did it and told me about it. They would take this inner tube out of the spare tire. This, that was before the, you know, the tubeless tires. Drive over to Mexico, fill up the car with gasoline, buy their butter, buy their milk, buy their eggs, and their coffee, put it inside the tire, put the rim back on. And since they didn't have drug sniffing dogs then, <laughs> no one found it, and they would bring it back home and use it for themselves. Did anybody do black marketing? I don't know. The people I talked of to said basically it was for family use. So that's, that's what happened there. How did we get food then? Other than going to Mexico and coming back, a lot of us had victory gardens. Uh, how many planted victory gardens here? Do you remember? You planted them? Yeah. What did you plant? I haven't any idea. My folks planted it out in the backyard. We lived on Arena Street and just dug up some of the backyard. <laughs> 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 and vegetables and so forth. Or whatever. We had corn, peppers, peas, and, and a rabbit that used to come along. And, 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 but that was, that was the victory. Most houses had it. The people that had problems were the farmers. Because this was the time before DDT. This was the time before insecticides. And they had a problem trying to get rid of the bugs, trying to get rid of the crows, trying to get rid of everything else. But one other thing that was interesting about that is that in the cities, they also had victory gardens. Being from the New York area, I don't remember this. I don't know why, but that's where they had it. One of the things that, that I do remember about Victory Gardens is that, remember burpee seeds? Yeah. Boy, every year, springtime, we would get someone come in and say, okay kids, here you go. And we'd go out and sell seeds for a nickel a pack. And, uh, you know, being that I was a salesman, I got a discount or so. Rationing. Rationing. You're going to have see some more pictures in there. Those were the numbers that were on there. Uh, my uncle had a store, so he was allowed to have a seat because he could deliver groceries to different people that couldn't get out of the house. 
Uh, he was also a butcher. How many remember horse meat? Sorry. Uh, you ever had horse meat? It's not bad. A little stringy, right? A little stringy. But that's what we had in some, in some instances. Auto cars, excellent mod mileage, and also you had to get tires. Tires was one of the hard things. Everything came in. Correspondence. A wonderful book back here about a gentleman from La Jolla who was a prisoner of war, and you can see some of the V-mail and information. But there's a very good V-mail one, and this little record thing, there used to be little things where the soldiers would go in and they'd record a little 78 plastic disc, and they would mail it home. During the Vietnam War, we had the little cassettes. Well, but this is, this is what they sent home. Um, Sensory. This is the letter from my cousin to his mother. And it was censored when it was sending it home. <coughs> I don't know how many received <coughs> censored messages. Those of us that were in school during that time would buy stamps to get a, a war bond. We couldn't afford the, I think it was 1875 for a $25 war bond. We could afford a quarter a week or two quarters of them. And that's what we would do. <coughs> Scrap dries, rubber, aluminum, steel, bed springs, everything was picked up in, in scrap drives. Um, how many of you remember saving grease? Boy, you know, you do your bacon, put it in a can, and you turn the grease in for the war effort. Because they needed it for munitions. So, uh, that's where they did it. Boy Scouts did it, churches did it. Uh, they collected paper and a whole bunch of other things. At the same time, they were watching their food. These are my sources, some of my sources. I did talk to a lot of people also. So uh, you get a chance to uh, talk to the people around you. Uh, all I'm doing is giving an introduction. If you've got any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them later. Judy, thank you. Thank you. Retired Jill of all trades, <laughs> including various aspects of drama and teaching. She came to La Jolla in 19, um, early in the war at the call of her husband, who trained at Camp Callan. And I'm going to make sure she tells you that story. Bob Mosier, who most of you know, retired architect who spent his summer vacations here. I think I just heard him say he came first in 1925. Uh, but he came as a young adult in 1944 to practice his trade as an architect. And Mildred Lee Bell, who was a young student here in La Jolla, graduated from La Jolla High in 1944. So they will share their experiences. I'll lead some topics here for them. Eugene, can I trade with you? Yes, you may. <laughs> you go over there. Go over there. <laughs> Listen to what the lady says. <laughs> so, if I can just start at this end and go down the line here asking the questions that are mainly for the people who spent time during the war in Mobile. But you will have your uh, Eugene Sherp in at any point. <laughs> and you all ask questions of everyone at the end. <coughs> What brought you to La Jolla? The war. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my husband uh, <clears throat> had tried to get into the Navy, but um, he was... Can you hear back there? Can you hear me? Yes, I should project. I'm a speech teacher. <laughs> 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 so, 
But they discovered he was colorblind, and so they wouldn't take him. And he said, all right, I'll wait on I'm drafted. And he was drafted, all right. But the Army got him. And he was fortunately sent out to Cap Callan, which is where UCSD mm -hmm. is now. And uh, it was sort of wintertime back in Wisconsin is where we lived. And so um, he said, you've got to come out here. It's so beautiful. So we had no children at the time. And so I packed up everything, put it in storage. And I hitchhiked out here, <laughs> sort of. Whoa. No, I, uh, I, I really did. It was, uh, after I got everything in storage, I looked at the newspaper and I found that two gentlemen were driving to San Diego and they wanted a, another party to share expenses. So I called them, told them who I was, and they said, fine. And I came out here with these two men. And do you know that I have forgotten completely everything about that trip. I don't remember <laughs> stopping anywhere, I don't remember eating, I don't remember anything. But when they learned I wanted to, I wanted to go to Camp Town, they took me right to the front entrance, said goodbye, and that's the last I saw. <laughs> Bob, what brought well, you to? Is this oh. working? Yes, it should be. Oh, good. <laughs> I uh, was at the University of Washington, and in my last half year, and joined the Army Reserve so that I could finish my, my get my degree. And to be a reporter before I got my degree, I was, I was invited down to Fort Lewis, Washington uh, to join the Army. <laughs> so they, they sort of reneged on their promise to get me my degree. And I went through basic training over down in uh, Missouri. Missouri, to uh, and uh, when I was just through basic training, they discharged me. The medical discharge, I had. They discovered I had asthma, which I hadn't told them about. And one of the things that you think about in those in those times is that a young man that of that age and with that background was completely indoctrinated into the spirit and the feelings for the war and for survival and for surviving this country, defending this country. So it was a great uh, disappointment and, and di uh, un unpleasant experience for me to be discharged, but I was discharged. I came back and went to the University of Washington, got my degree, came back to Los Angeles and discovered that uh, an architect who had been my neighbor in Los Angeles for many years uh, had, who and a wonderful firm, had just been awarded the contract to design Camp Pendleton. They had had a lot to do with Camp Cal originally. And so they opened an office in San Diego and I came down here to open that office. And as I walked into my boss's first personal private office the first time, here was a lovely, lovely young woman. And I thought, well, you know, I, nothing could be better than this. <laughs> I was thrilled. Anyway, uh, I went to work in San Diego and, and had to, and, and was wanted to live here in Hawaii because, as we, we pointed out, I, I had been here as a, as a child every summer for right up to the war. So that's, that's how I got here, and I uh, went right to work. <laughs> and, under, and under the spell of the lovely young woman. <laughs> Melder? Yes. Uh, I came here in uh, 1936, and my reason for being here was my mother was looking for a place where she could earn 50 cents an hour to support her child. Oh. And, that, and this was a good place for that. She received the word that, uh, that uh, the pay was good in Hawaii, you could make as much as 50 cents an hour. And at that time, we were living uh, in Calexico, right on the Mexican border there. And uh, that, you know, you can imagine what kind of existence that was. So she got everything in order, uh, parked me with my grandparents, and she moved to Hawaii to look for a better way 
uh, to live and to earn a living. And in the fall, she got me, brought me here, and enrolled me in La Jolla Elementary in fourth grade. So I was there then from fourth grade all the way through 12th grade. So that's what got me here, economics. <laughs> All right, each of you has had some experience with the military during World War II, some of it vicarious and some of it direct. Would you like to share any of that with us? Well, um, you, know, you know, before I uh, before I continue, I want to ask your indulgence if I forget things. <laughs> um, you know, but I've been uh, assured that at 97, um, 98 and 10 days. <laughs> wow. So forgetting things now and then is allowed. I will do my very best. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> do you have any experiences with military? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> well, all I can say is that as far as I'm concerned, they were, uh, they were very nice to be with, they were gracious, especially the fellows at Captain Callan. I worked in the, um, uh, for a while, I worked in the hospital in the offices, and I also worked in the library, and had very nice experiences with everyone there. They were very gracious. You might also tell about your <laughs> Did I do that? No, I didn't. wanted to wake us up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been it's an early morning. <laughs> trip to the Philippines? Oh, well, yes, yes. He was sent to the Philippines and uh, <clears throat> spent uh, several years there. And uh, on the way to land in Leyte, they were, um, his ship was, was uh, torpedoed. And I, of course, I didn't find out about this until much later. And he kept asking me to send him things, and I couldn't understand. Why? Well, he took those with him. Why does he want some more? <laughs> and he couldn't tell me because that the censorship, the censorship <laughs> took, <laughs> took it to toll. But I found out about that later. So um, that was the, um, the he had no experience there. He was in intelligence. He had been trained in intelligence at Camp Callan. Camp Callan was an anti-aircraft military base, and so he um, he found, had some interesting experiences. Bob, I know you. Well, <clears throat> when I got here, I moved in temporarily with my cousins, the McNaughts. I don't know if any of you remember Barge, Marge, or Robert McNaught. He was a building contractor and did some very lovely houses. That he and so I had, a, I had some place to stay while I, to get started. But I could not find any place, decent place, for a single person to live. There were no little apartments. There were no even any single rooms. And so I moved into La Valencia. <laughs> Desperation. <laughs> well, it turned out to be awful. <laughs> because this is how the military entered into it. There were many, many second lieutenant um, uh, marines <coughs> and, and uh, ensign na naval officers, all of whom had girlfriends and all of whom loved booze <laughs> because it was just one of the noisiest, <laughs> all, of the, all night, every night. <laughs> I was trying to work in the daytime and get to sleep at night, and I was succeeding at neither one, really. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that was my initial experience with the, the military. You can imagine, though, uh, I, I, I got, I, when I got out of the Army, I got my car back, and it was a convertible. So I had my convertible here in San Diego, and I had, by that time, a lovely date, cons constant date all the time with my boss's secretary. <laughs> and I was driving around town with all these Navy and Marine Corps people, you know, looking at me sideways every t everywhere I went. And it was, it, it was kind of tough in a, in a way, this being a military town.
to be a young civilian with a seemingly able body. <laughs> seemingly able body, yes. But that that was my experience with it, with the uh, with the military initially. I finally found a very nice place to live, a little apartment over Hilda Berenger's real estate office, which was at 862 Prospect Street. You can uh, see where it once was at the right, you know, just right off Gerard Avenue. So that, that's, uh, that's how I got a place to live, and I stayed there until the war was over. Okay. I'm, I'm, you got it. Uh, although I was kind of young at the time, uh, when we were in Trinidad, we lived on an army installation that was built. Um, the school there only ran half a day, but uh, we really we really enjoyed that, and, and the soldiers <laughs> took care of the family. Uh, we would go to the movies, uh, since they didn't have a movie theater there, we would go to a place called Dockside, which was down by the uh, Port of Spain Naval Station. It was an outdoor theater. Um, and they would run 60 millimeter films for the for the Navy personnel, and uh, we would get to go see there, see them there. I did when we were evacuated. We were evacuated by the Army Air Corps, and it was my first flight in a in a Goonie Burger. <laughs> Didn't keep you out of the Air Force. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I had. To very much um, uh, to do with with the servicemen or whatnot in the war. Uh, the, the men of my acquaintance who actually participated in the war were, were teenagers, of course, when it began. And so oh, some of them were ultimately drafted. And uh, the only experience I had with uh, any of the military personnel at, Mount, at uh, Camp Calvin was just to see them uh, come into La Jolla and go up and down the street. And it was pretty interesting, too, because I, the Army, I don't know if this is deliberate, but they seem to like to mix their personnel. If, if they draft you in the South, they like to send you to the West. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's the way they do it. They, they mix everything up. So I need not tell you that these men who were drafted in the Deep South and sent to Camp Callan for training and then to come to La Jolla on their times off, there was a culture shock. <laughs> two, two totally different lifestyles were colliding on the streets of, of, town, <laughs> of town La Jolla. So that, that was pretty funny. But I, I had no really, in, and really had no involvement with the military, except that San Diego is basically a Navy town. So all we ever saw, all I ever saw, were sailors. But then, uh, uh, after the war started, we did get out at Campo, we got Buffalo soldiers. You hear a lot about them now. And we had the 10th uh, tenth and 10th tenth Cavalry. Uh, there and uh, so that that was my involvement with them, and they would come in then to socialize with the uh, black residents here. And some of them were in La Jolla and made friends with people in La Jolla, so I got to know them. And also some of the Navy personnel uh, would come and socialize here in La Jolla. So that that was basically uh, the only way I was involved with the with the actual service people during that time. <clears throat> well, we moved to civilian life in La Jolla during the war, and I've, I've got a list of things, and maybe you can pick, I think each of you have the list if you want to pick something out in particular that rings with you as we go through. i tell you the list is shortages, housing, which Bob has already talked on. Mm -hmm. so we have, I know that... Uh, Dorothy has some stories on housing as well. <laughs> <laughs> Dim outs, aerial searchlights, camouflage nets, gunneries, bird rock, and the shores. Uh, population, which Mildred has talked about, has touched on already. Uh, 
and what to do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this business of, uh, of the so-called searchlights. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the and I, at Bird Rock, there was an anti-aircraft station. Now, I'm sure many of you remember it because we were blacked out or dimmed out here in La Jolla. We crept around with our with our car lights on parking and we had our houses all dimmed out. And here was this anti-aircraft station. Every night, a huge display of fireworks <laughs> with the, all these anti-aircraft guns firing at targets that were being towed out over the water. And one of the nice things about it for me and my gal was that there was a wonderful place to park and watch all this. <laughs> and being young as we were, you know. So, <laughs> it, 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 it served us very well. It was certainly tough on the town because, you know, if a Japanese submarine wanted to find La Jolla, <laughs> without the without the air aircraft station, they'd have had a problem. <laughs> With it, they had no problem at all. It was, it was a simple thing of finding all this fireworks going on every night, and then letting us have it, which they didn't do. I don't remember the fireworks so much, but I do remember watching the searchlights up at Camp Callan all night long. They would go across the sky and uh, oh, looking for airplanes or whatever came by. And, I, and, and then at a certain hour, very late, usually 11 or 12 o'clock, suddenly they stopped. But before they stopped, all of the lights, all of the searchlights would flash across mm -hmm. the sky all at once, before it had been just one at a time. But then here we are, <coughs> and I would just wait for them. <laughs> knew that my husband was up there and, and probably helping with some of that. So that that was sort of interesting, I thought. But I don't remember the fireworks that you had. Boy. Of course, I didn't have the boyfriend. My boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> some of your other topics. Uh, <laughs> Well, yes, we we uh, did need. We had ration cards for gasoline when they were used up. We always went down to Tijuana. And we went down to Tijuana a lot, <laughs> but uh, we fill up. Uh, we didn't do what you did. <laughs> I never thought about that. <laughs> we uh, would get, would fill up our car with gas. But this gave us an opportunity to go down to Rosarita Beach Hotel and get a wonderful steak dinner. <laughs> that, that, because we missed that. We didn't have that. Of course, I was living in, um, I, I wasn't living in a house. I didn't, I was just living in rooms and uh, garages. Many people uh, converted their garages to small apartments. And, uh, and so I, lived in several garages <laughs> and uh, the um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask Mr. Altaro about was shortages and you never you uh, were you aware of the spices being short yes because that's the one thing that we I noticed and that was pepper okay. we couldn't find much pepper and if we did it was very costly. It was very costly. So, would you like to know what I did? Yes. <laughs> we, we practiced. <laughs> yes, well, <clears throat> I started looking around at all these pepper trees. <laughs> and I got to look, watch them, the berries that were bright red, start out bright red and end up brown or almost black. And I thought, well, those look like peppercorns and a pepper tree. Why not try it? So I collected a couple handfuls of these peppers and I ground them up as fine as I could, and it worked. It, really? 
Yes, it really did. <laughs> uh, I would say, if anything, that it was a milder form of pepper than we import now. Um, but it, it had flavor and it worked on the food. It was just fine. And it was the same way with the dishes. I came out here with just my clothes. And our, all our dishes and things, pots and pans, were all packed away in storage. So I thought, well, I don't want to invest in any expensive dishes. So I got to thinking about the clay pots that I would see down in Tijuana. <laughs> and I thought, well, if those women can use those pots for cooking, then why can't I? <laughs> So I went down there and picked up a few. They were very inexpensive at that mm -hmm. time, very inexpensive. But we were warned that before we ate anything or cooked in them, that they needed to be treated. And the treatment was just filling them with water, bringing them to a boil on top of the stove gently, and letting them boil about an hour. And this seemed to dissolve this a glaze that they used inside of the dishes. And we ate out of these dishes for years. <laughs> Here she is. Having been a bachelor, as I was, I, I didn't have a kitchen. Hilda's little, little apartment didn't have a kitchen. So I had to eat out whenever I was alone or not being entertained. And uh, <laughs> one of the places there, I've, I've been sitting here trying to remember, maybe one of you will remember the name of the little restaurant, just a counter down in Bird Rock. And it was, the, it was named after the woman who served you and her husband did the cooking. And once in a while they would have a steak. <laughs> and they let they let their old friends like me know when they were going to have a steak and they get some real meat. <laughs> but the thing that I want to remind you of, those of you who were here then, there was a wonderful restaurant called the Village Cupboard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it was my hangout. Oh. I had I ate all my breakfast there. Of course, it was just a half a block down the street. But I had all my breakfast, and Rippy was the cook. And he was, they were partners, he and Charles. I think the man out front was Charles. And Charles would greet you with them any time of day, and they served all the way through dinner. And they served wonderful dinners. But Rippy somehow managed every day to make pie. Does anybody remember the pie? It was so good, they were the best pies you could imagine. And Rippy turned these pies out, so every night, I would be there having my dinner and sure enough have a piece of pie. <laughs> but that, that, was, that was not a, just, whatever shortages there were, they managed to serve really nice dinners and lunches and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Mildred, maybe you could tell us something about it, what it was like to be a student in high school during the war. I don't remember that we were terribly affected uh, of course, there, were, there was a sense of uh, uh, loyalty and, and uh, really being uh, uh, concerned about being successful in the war and success, uh, concerned about our, our men who were going to war and, and uh, who were being exposed and whatnot. There was some concern about that, but we were youngsters, and how, how, how worried do youngsters get about things? And I don't, I don't have a, a sense of um, food shortages because uh, there was just my mother and me, and how much could we eat? So, <laughs> you know, so any small amount of anything uh, pretty well fed us. And uh, for a number of years, um, she worked for a family a split day, and she went in the morning, I guess, and did the cleaning and laundry and whatever else, and then came home or went to another job, 
And that, that's terrible. And she had to walk from place to place, too, because there was no <coughs> transportation in the way. But anyway, then, then she would come home, and she would go back in the evening and, and serve dinner and clean up. Well, when she did that, very often she would bring enough food home <laughs> for, the two, for the two of us, because there were only two people in the, in the family where she lived. I don't know, some of you might have remembered uh, Mr. Bigelow. He owned the La Jolla Garage, I believe, and she worked for them. And uh, so there were just two of them, and whatever they didn't eat or serve for dinner, she was free to bring home. So she would come home and give me, instruct me to cook some vegetables or something. And so that would be dinner. So the food shortage really did not concern us. And uh, in, in high school, in the cafeteria, uh, when, I, when I had a meeting with, the, with the, our, our reunion class, one of the things we discussed was the, the lunches, the cafeteria lunches. And we all had fond memories of those lunches. <laughs> I, I don't know that I've heard any people praise school, school lunches <laughs> recently, but we thought they were wonderful. And there were two or three things they had that we wished we knew how to cook. <laughs> they had a, a dessert. It was a, like a, a, a chocolate. Uh, like a chocolate pie, a little round thing cut in half, and then it had whipped cream filling or something. And those were just the most wonderful things. And, and, and we were there at the reunion talking and discussing those pies. <laughs> so, and uh, there's one interesting thing I'd like to share with you. You're talking about where you lived when you lived at the Valencia. Uh, I, I was called in to help a friend who, who worked for a group of young men at the uh, beach and tennis club. And they were here as uh, workers at the conveyor. And of course, there was a shortage, housing shortage. So can you imagine? They got together. There were about four or five of them. And they rented that large apartment that's above the marine room <laughs> at, the, at the beach and tennis club. And they shared that apartment in ships. One group of them, I guess, <laughs> one group worked nights and the other worked days. And, and the, this friend of ours was their cook and the cleaning lady. And they, and she imported me yes. to help her there. And so, so I helped with the cleaning, and we'd make the bed. So the, when the morning shift, uh, uh, the day shift left, we'd make the beds and get ready for the next food. And she would cook enough food for both shifts. And, and that was just interesting, that big luxurious apartment. And that's what was going on in the Uh, one of the topics that has been touched on, but I think there's more to explore in it, is how the population in La Jolla changed during the war. Well, yes, I can tell you, of course, naturally the black population increased because that, that brought in uh, many new people who came here seeking employment. So uh, that uh, the black population swelled, and I, I imagine the other did too, but I, I, I wasn't terribly aware of that, but I was aware of what was going on uh, right around me. As a matter of fact, my, uh, my eventual husband's grandmother came here, an elderly lady, and that's how she, why she came to La Jolla, because she found that she could come here and she could get a job at Convair and uh, make enough money to save to go back to Texas and finish the house that she was building or something down there. So there was a lot of, lot of that going on, and the population really swelled. There was always um, a considerable black population. If you and the Historical Society uh, have been in contact with the, the lady who is writing uh, who's who's uh, the motivating force behind the the uh, black history, uh, the history of uh, black people in La Jolla? That that you you found out that there are a number, there were quite a number of black people here, and strangely enough, uh, through the years, people have thought that there were not many, 
And, and when I would say to people through the years, well, you know, I grew up in La Jolla. In La Jolla. Yeah, in the audience. <laughs> 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 we were there. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> and, uh, so there were cons uh, quite, quite a number of black people there already, but then with the war years, it, it, the, the population really swelled. It, well, the whole population swelled. You know, so, uh, so the residences yes. were fairly confined. To a specific area oh, yes. in La Jolla. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the black, there were a few black people on Eads uh, between Silver and Klein. And um, then um, on Eads, there were one or two, three families, I think, on Eads right at Silver, at the intersection of Silver, because my mother and I were one of those families at one time. We lived there. Then the little short street, Silver, and then gone, and then Draper from Pearl to Silver, and, and Cuvier from Pearl to the Bishop School boundary. And uh, all of the black population was combined right there in that little tight area. And uh, when more people started to come in, then of course you could just rent anything and everything, but that was pretty well the case during the war years everywhere. The house I live in now in San Diego was owned by my grandfather at that time, but uh, our family hadn't lived in it for many, many years. And the lady had rented it from him, I think, for uh, $30 a month or something, and then she went and she put Yale locks in all the doors <laughs> <laughs> and rented it, rented it as rooms during, <laughs> during the war years. And for years after I moved back in that house, I would meet people and they'd say, oh yes, I used to live in this house. <laughs> So, so it, yes, it, there wasn't, there wasn't. So in 1944, my family bought the Green Dragon Colony. And we inherited a, a Mexican gardener, Jose, who turned out to be one of the dearest, most loyal, hardest working, good friend that we could imagine ever having. And, and, you, and my father and he became very good friends. And Jose lived on Eads in this area where, where uh, it, it, was in, it was zoned industrial, amazingly enough. And he lived there for, he had owned the house that he lived in. He had, paid, he had worked long enough to own that house. And one day, when the war was over, he came to my father and he told him that he had been offered $50,000 for his house. Imagine, $50,000 for, for a Mexican worker. And he didn't know what to do because he didn't know where he would move. There was no place for him to move that he knew of. So my dad said, well, what if you would move, go, walk across the street, walk across Pearl Street, and find out if there's a house there for sale that you could live in, and go to the neighbors, and say to the neighbors, I am a Mexican worker, and I, I, I would like to buy the house at the such and such an address. How would you, what would you think about my doing that? Now you can imagine, if you put yourself in the, in the position of people in that era and under those uh, uh, social conditions, this man having the nerve, my dad had to really talk him into doing it, to do this. And he went to the neighbors on each side of him and across the street and told them what he was doing. And those people, bless their hearts, <clears throat> they all agreed that he, Jose and his family should move into their neighborhood. There were no black people, there were no Mexicans in, in, that, in that part of the town. And he, he bought the house, he sold, he sold his house, 
He put enough money away with my dad's help to retire when the time came for him to retire. And I just, <clears throat> I kind of choke up when I think about conditions and, and, and what it meant to Joe and his family and how wonderful that really was and how supportive my dad was of, of this really wonderful thing. <clears throat> Is Jose's courthouse named after him? Yeah. Big pardon? Is Jose's courthouse named after him? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Different Jose. We had, we had a sense of loyalty to that man, and we loved him. He became my friend, of course, as I, as I opened my office and began to practice out of that area. And uh, we, we became very close. And his, his family grew up to, to be commendable citizens. It was, it was a good story. <laughs> well, I was just going to, um, I, I was reminded of um, an incident that occurred during our stay here. And uh, we got to know the Army chaplain uh, very well because he and his wife had a very lovely home here in La Jolla. And every Sunday, they would have an open house for the military, for the military boys and girls, because that, they seemed so young to me. And I would go with my husband, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a very interesting time we met. We had Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, all in their uniforms, they would come to this open house. And of course, one of the attractions was the good food that was served. <laughs> but still, we made a lot of friends that way. However, it was a rather sweet, sad time, too. Because you got to know these people, and you think you've got a real friend, and you look forward to the next Sunday that you'd be seeing them again, and the next Sunday arrived and they didn't come. They weren't there. So then you asked around and they said, oh, he, they shipped out. He was shipped out or she was shipped out. And you never heard from them again. It, it was, it, it was a... What scary. part of La Jolla was that house in that had the open house on Sundays? Um, it was, it, it was the southern, south side. Oh, okay. Calvin Cal West, West to the north, north right? Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. So, um, uh, but we did a lot of did a lot of things. They had a piano and they sang and they danced mm -hmm. and, and they told jokes and stories. And some of the uh, military brought their own instruments and played those. So it was it was a very happy time too. But um, you you oh, and if you found someone from your state. You were immediate buddies. <laughs> it didn't matter how far away you lived from each other. You were buddies. And, and that happened frequently, too. So from all over the country, they, they were here. But I, I, I suddenly remembered that. I hadn't thought about that for a long time. And I, I remembered that. I thought I'd like to share that. The other thing was <clears throat> that I, uh, I don't think I told you this was the police department formed a motor pool for women. And I wanted to belong to that, so I joined it. And uh, it, was, it was very interesting that to belong. You had to take a class in what was under the hood of your car. Oh. <laughs> so, I learned all about spark plugs and cleaning them and replacing them. And, and um, uh, I don't think cars have spark plugs in them. <laughs> uh, I haven't heard about spark plugs for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I learned to check my oil and change the oil and check my tires and change tires. And that was pretty tricky. But then the best part of it was, came when you had your duty. And it would be just a couple of hours. And I would drive in, with, you used your own cars. And I would drive into La Jolla from uh, Bird Rock. And uh, 
park right in front of the police station, right in one of their spots. Because I was up and I backed in. That was all. <laughs> Uh, as far as I can remember, we never got a call. <laughs> but I was ready. <laughs> it, was, it was lots of fun. I was very proud of that, that I could do that. <laughs> One last question from me, and then the rest of will we'll turn it over to you all. Ask questions. How did La Jolla change at the end of the war? Oh, <laughs> I'd like to comment on that. Rather <laughs> seriously, uh, my memory of the time and uh, since I was a little chap, uh, all through World War II, Gerard Avenue had a character that was principally Spanish, Mediterranean, Mexican buildings. Remember the little folk shop? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. And it had a character that, as I look back now, I put huge value on. It was it was quite wonderful. You could get the pictures <coughs> and look at them. And unfortunately, all those buildings are gone. Oh, mm -hmm. I may have contributed <laughs> to, the, to the demise of that wonderful architecture. There's one left opposite the um, the post office that Tom Shepard designed, and it's still there. Uh, it's tile roofed and has arches. And every time I go to the post office, which I plan to go continuously to the next all the way. <laughs> well, we're all going to have to get behind the, the move movement to save the post office. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is a valuable asset to this community and its character. But I, I am sorry that I didn't contribute more to saving those buildings on Gerard Avenue. Mm -hmm. Now, they were good commercial properties. <coughs> they weren't as fancy as they are now. But uh, I think back, just sitting here thinking how much I remember them with joy and pleasure. Mm -hmm. know too much about the changes in one way after the war because I moved. After high school, I moved. My mother decided to move back to the family home that I was talking about a while ago. My husband was in service and I was living home again with my mother so I moved with her. And that was the end of my La Jolla experience except coming back and forth to visit. My uh, father-in-law and his wife, who some of you know, Maybell, uh, uh, lived here, so we came out sometimes to see them, and we had a few friends who were still here, but I really had no ties to La Jolla until my granddaughters were in high school, and I have two granddaughters who uh, I persuaded to come to La Jolla to school. So, so both of them came out and uh, went to La Jolla High and graduated here in the, in the 90s. I think, but those, those are my, my only experiences uh, with La Jolla after the, after the war years. Oh, there was one thing I'd like to share with you. I, I hadn't heard anyone mention this, and this was during the school time during the war years and our air raid uh, drills, you know. We had air, air raid warnings and air raid drills, and I don't know if anyone mentioned to you, our place of safety was across on the other side of Fay because the streetcar, the streetcar ran down Fay and had a stop at La Jolla High as it continued on. And our, our place of, of safety was across Fay and across the streetcar track and into the bluffs on the other side of the junior high school. Yeah, uh -huh, yes, where, where the junior high school is and there's some houses over there and they were, those were, were bluffs with um, uh, openings and similar to small caves or something. So when we had when we had air raid drills, that's what we did. We all filed out and filed across the streetcar track and into the bluffs over there. That was our place. Thank you, thank you, Winona. That's all. Nothing. I don't think you could hear me. I just heard a voice. That's all. 
Dean, any final comments you want to make? No, I think I've learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when I first came to La Jolla, I felt uh, it was a very intimate place, and it seemed more like a village mm -hmm. than a, a city it is now. It was, you got to know everybody. You knew everybody in the stores, you got to know the owners, you got to know the people who worked there, and you walked down the street, hi, how's your mom? Um, you know, it was, it was a very, very friendly, pleasant place. Now, after the war, of course, uh, there was an exodus of a lot of people, especially the, the uh, the soldiers and the uh, military who had their, their families here, they wanted to go home. They wanted to go live with grandma and grandpa, with, for the, with the children. And that was, so there was a, a great exodus of people and uh, <clears throat> at that time. And then suddenly um, you got to have the feeling that new people were coming in Shops were changing, owners were changing, uh, people were, um, new shops appeared. They seemed more sophisticated than the, the uh, friendly uh, shops that had been in the village. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I may have been part of, I didn't reach out to them like I did to the original village. Yeah, but at that later at that time, I was I was starting to have children. I had no children up to that point, and uh, so I was busy doing things. And but I did notice the the there were I didn't go into town as much as I used to. I went other places. It was it was just a different feeling. There wasn't the camaraderie that you had had before because of all the strange people. <laughs> <laughs> I walk, I live just, uh, you know, 100 feet up the street at 800, and I walk on our streets a lot. Every day I'm out on the streets. And do you know there are days when I can walk down Girard Avenue and not hear English spoken? <laughs> Literally not hear it. I, I think one of the sad things that's happened to us, and it's a Direct result of the economics of the community and its reputation in the world now, or certainly in the United States, we've lost a lot of our services. I miss the lumber yard. <laughs> I, I would just like to have a lumber yard. And there, and there was a sheet metal shop, and there was a glass shop, and there a lot of services that are gone. And I think that is a, too, a great loss to us as citizens of the community. I'm sad about that. It's in a movie theater? <laughs> <laughs> we do need to celebrate the ones we do still have. Oh gosh, you know, I remember right when the world war was over, I was dating uh, a young woman who uh, was living temporarily in the Colonial Hotel. And the Colonial Hotel was at the lobby had a lot of older men who had nothing to do in the evening, would sit around in the lobby and talk. And they'd sort of sit on chairs lined up and down this, this wall. Very, very strange circumstances. Anyway, they, when I would go and pick up my date, I'd hear these fellows talking, and one of them would say to the other one, what do you suppose is playing at the Granada? <laughs> I think that was something grand. I love that. <laughs> oh, that was that, that amused me. So it still amuses me. <laughs> the memory of those old gentlemen there uh -huh. wondering what was playing at the grand. <laughs> so, would you like to ask some questions of our panelists here? I was listening to your uh, description of of uh, what you did on an air raid drill. Yes. I, would, I was born and raised in San Diego, but I had a lot of friends here in La Jolla. But my school remembrance at Grant School in Mission Hills was that we had barrage balloons all over our playground. And so when the whistle blew and we had an air raid, 
we ran out to the playground and went like this, and the garage balloons, uh, I guess, camouflaged that it was a schoolyard. Oh. The other thing I remember, looking out from the balcony of my house towards San Diego Bay, we could see the top of Consolidated Voltee, mm -hmm. and they had a village of, com of camouflage on the top of the roof, and it was absurd. I mean, when we looked at it, we thought, this is so dumb looking. <laughs> but I suppose it kept the, the aircraft place from being... The other thing I remember is I had a lot of friends in, San in uh, La Jolla, Jane Trevor, or yes, Jane Trevor, Mimi Rollins, and uh, Nancy Corbin, and uh, we would spend the night up on Hillside at, at Jane Trevor's house, and we could hear in the morning all the artillery practice from, I guess it was Camp Callan, mm -hmm. or right. Camp Matthews every morning, <laughs> and there was nothing up on the La Jolla Mesa, so when I married Lee, and we came back to visit our families here, my family, and I said, what is that up there above the flying A station? We're coming in on old 101. And he said, oh, that's University of California, the new University of California. And I said, well, why don't you get a job there? <laughs> and he said, because they're only hiring Nobel laureates. <laughs> Yes. No one mentioned Spence at the movie. Oh. Oh. And I thought it was sort of a, almost all mayor. Yeah. Yeah. Spence Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a comment about the uh, camouflage on the, on the uh, oh. Oh. On conveyor. They also had it locking it up in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. The, uh, it may have looked funny from the ground. <laughs> but, but it didn't look funny from the air, because from the air, when you take pictures of it, at that time most of them were black and white, it would look like a town. And it wasn't all painted. They had items there that were built up of cardboard, uh, maybe a one-story house, a tree, and a few things like that. So it, from the air, you wouldn't be able to tell there was a factory in there. And remember that in 1944, uh, General Patton was in charge of an army in England that was made up of dummy tanks, dummy trucks, specifically for the Germans to come over and, and, uh, and look and say, oh, that's where they are. And there was nothing there. <laughs> Gosh, you know, the ones at Convair uh, were made, the all of that was made with chicken feathers. <laughs> and I worked, I lived in La Jolla, but I worked in the Spreckles Theater building uh, downtown San Diego, and every morning I would drive down Pacific Highway, the only way to get down there, and have the most terrible hay fever. <laughs> I, uh, well, that's just what I was going to say. When my mother and I drove from past Christian, Mississippi, to Los Angeles, it was in July, so we came straight to San Diego and then up to L.A. When we were on Pacific Coast Highway going by where Convair is, all that netting was over with, I guess it was chicken feathers, it looked like leaves. Mm -hmm. But that's what I remember in 1944, driving through San Diego <coughs> on the way to L.A. <laughs> I, I have some pictures of that. That is one of the memories that I have of driving here <coughs> to Camouflage because that's the only way you could get into San Diego going along Pacific Highway mm -hmm. because five hadn't been built yeah. yet. That came, yeah. that came later. And I do have some pictures of the Camouflage and if any of you are interested in seeing them, I have them here and you'll see what it looks like. I had no idea a friend of ours worked on the design for the camouflage and he said that if the plane flew over you could only see little sheds and bushes and maybe fields and, and nothing much that would give them any clues. They also put false fronts on some of the air, air, airplane uh, factories that made them look like apartment houses and trees and I finally I also do volunteer work at the uh, San Diego History Center, and I work in the uh, photographic archives. And one day I found these pictures 
and uh, I, I have them. I thought I have to have those because I, they're memories for me too. And I have them here, and they would be very. I'd be happy to share with them. Then, with any of you who want to look at them. Yes. I had a question: whether any of you um, experienced water shortages in La Jolla? Was that a, was that a problem with the swelling population? Not to my knowledge. I was never aware of that. No. I think that must be earlier. Were there actually any substantiated Japanese subs found near the coast? No, actually, that's one question that I know when we've been doing our oral histories, we have talked to people about the Japanese American yeah. population that was here in Bird Rock and in Pacific Beach in particular. Uh, and, but I, I think the only one who was here when the internment happened is. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 no, uh, Mildred was here. Mildred was in school at that time. She was asking about and the now I know. Yeah, she wanted to know about the She was asking about the submarines. Yeah. 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 Oh, my Japanese question was actually about the submarine. Japanese population actually, um, Anybody that remembers the submarine that shelled the oil platform in Santa Barbara? Mm -hmm. If you look, and that was in February of 42, if you look at the records at Fort Rosecrans, which was the, you know, which of was the cemetery, it was an army fort at that time, uh, it was reported somebody did sight a submarine offshore a couple of days before it hit Santa Barbara. And they really? scrambled planes from North Island and supposedly tried to find it and never did. But mm -hmm. that's the only sighting of any submarine that's ever been done. Which is not to say there weren't rules about when you could be on the beach here and <coughs> from what we've heard. Are you talking about just in Southern California? No, just San Diego. San Diego. Oh, San Diego. Yeah. 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 Um, there was another one in Oregon. And, uh -huh. and there's another little, little one story. The Japanese actually had planned to shell 10 lighthouses along the coast on Christmas Eve, 1941. <laughs> and oh, after the war, their records were recovered, and one of those submarines was supposed to shell the Point Home Lighthouse. <laughs> but a day or so before, they got a little nervous. These were their, their big main, their best submarines. And a couple of days before, they got a little nervous that we had too many planes in the air. <laughs> and then once they exposed the subs, they would be dangerous, so they recalled them all and never happened. Nobody ever knew about this until after the war. But I have a question for that. Anybody who's lived here a long time, there's a center block building just on Via Capri, right near the Easter Cross. It now is part of, I think, used to UCSD, but at one time, I don't know. Does anybody know what that was ever used for? So I hear rumors. It was an anti-aircraft station. There were a number of bunkers up on the top of the mountain. Yeah, yeah. this is this is right by where the Eastern Cross is now. Yeah, there's one of them. I, I went through. Uh, it it's now a lab for SIO, but it was, yeah, it was at one time a very thickly armored, you know, like 16 feet of concrete aircraft uh, viewing spot. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Well, I, I know I live up okay. there, and the house behind me is built on top of those. Oh. And water collects it. Oh. <laughs> and they drained it off onto our front. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and thank you all so much. And before we quit here, I would like to invite you to sing happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Know of similar 
citizens with stories like this, please get a hold of Judy. All of or if you want to volunteer to do yeah. interviewing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you. All of you guys are You're amazing. We have a couple things for you. We know there was coffee ration. So we, I'm not going to load it up, but we have a coffee mug. Right <laughs> Keep it full. We have memberships for uh, Jean and uh, Mildred Fair, because we know you're not members, but now you are. <laughs> and, uh, and then the last thing, we just have a couple of tiles that we'll be giving. Oh, we can't thank you enough. Thank you for what you do here. Thank you for what you bring to the table. Thank you.